One of the architects of the 2016 World Series champions, Chicago Cubs. A little bouncer slowly toward Bryant. He will glove it and throw to Rizzo. It's in time, and the Chicago Cubs win the World Series. Jed Hoyer, building and talking Chicago Cubs baseball with Mully and Haw. Because I have utmost trust in those guys, starting with Jed, of course, from the top. On 670, the score. Mully and Haw, Chicago Sports Radio, 670, the score. It's a delight to welcome in Jed Hoyer, the Cubs president of baseball operations, and he joins us now on the score hotline, powered by IBEW Local 9, Chicago's original powerhouse since 1892. Jed, good morning. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Doing well. We're fired up because, honestly, like it feels like the playoff baseball is going on right now. Like tonight will be kind of, you know, I know it's uh, – it's not the must-win playoff elimination stuff, but it feels like this is a different level of game. No question. I mean, I think actually look at this series we have coming up, and then, you know, Cincinnati, San Francisco, a lot of games against Arizona left. I mean, it's fun, right? It's going to be a great environment at the ballpark every night. Uh, you know, we're playing, you know, playoff contenders in the next five series. So, yeah, no, I totally agree with you. It's a, it's a great feeling that, you know, everyone's going to be showing up to the ballpark today with that much excitement. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll keep on uh, playing the way we have been for a couple months. Jed, I feel like the Cubs are better than a lot of people thought they would be. I wonder if they're better than you thought they would be and how maybe your expectations for what qualifies as success this season has changed. Well, I think there's no question we've um, kind of uh, outpaced our projections to a certain extent. I mean, I think early in the season, um, we were the opposite, that we were sort of underperforming where we thought we'd be. And um, we sort of couldn't get going. We kept talking about this positive run differential and these great underlying numbers, and we couldn't get things going. And then really, you know, since mid-June, uh, we've been playing really up to the level of those underlying numbers and playing exceptionally well. So, yeah, I mean, I think uh, the last two and a half months have definitely exceeded my expectations. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. And I think that's what happens when you've got a really cohesive group. And I think it's what happens when you have some players that are, you know, doing things that probably weren't projected going into the season. Uh, Jed, it's kind of interesting because obviously we, we, uh, we're we all kind of taken aback when, when Marcus Stroman went down and you see that and everybody is kind of shaking their head. And you guys have been forced to rely on some of your homegrown pitching and it's been extraordinary. It's been a great uh, year for homegrown, homegrown players, homegrown pitchers. Um, you know, we talked earlier about the greatest mound visit in uh, MLB history uh, that happened earlier in the weekend. And obviously, we've seen all these guys come up and contribute in, in the way they have, starting with, with Justin Steele. Is that particularly um, pleasing to you? to have those guys be able to make the impact they have this year? Well, no question. I mean, it's been well-documented, well-discussed that, you know, during our run of success, we didn't uh, draft and develop pitching well. Um, some of the guys we really leaned on were guys that we traded for, you know, guys like Jake and, and, and guys guys like Hendricks. And we obviously signed the, the Lesters and the Hamels and Lackeys and all these guys that had these, these contributions, and it wasn't through homegrown guys. And so, yes, it is immensely gratifying to get those kind of contributions out of, you know, the steals and adverts and you guys, you know, Assad throwing well, which was, was terrific the other night. And I think we have more to come, which is really exciting. And um, you need a lot of pitching. There's no question that you know, in today's game, um, I always say, if you have one, you have none. You have to have a lot of guys that, that can um, step in and, and, and be able to pitch because guys aren't throwing 225 innings anymore. You have to rely on a lot of guys, and you know, luckily, uh, player development has done a great job. Our scouting department has done a great job, and we've, uh, I think, we've turned the corner towards you know being able to you know bring these guys up in a in a pen race and have them succeed. And and the hope is that we just continue to do that, you know, one after another, because I do think that's success in modern baseball is having just a ton of pitching at your disposal. You've had a lot of guys contribute in ways that maybe you didn't expect. You mentioned some of those things that happen in a season like this. Michael Tuchman, Javier Assad, Julian Merriweather. Those aren't guys you necessarily expect to produce 
in spring training. Everybody can look at Cody Bellinger. What a great move that was, Jed, in terms of signing him and a prove-it deal, and he has proven a lot. But what other move are you proudest of? What other guy has come through in a way maybe that makes you feel like that was exactly the way it went, but, boy, you couldn't have projected? Yeah, well, a couple. I mean, you mentioned uh, Talkman and Merriweather. Uh, you know, all the credit in the world to our pro scouting department for identifying those guys um, and believing in them. And you know, to have a successful season, you're going to have to have guys contribute that you didn't, didn't imagine, you know, would when we got to, to spring training. And those two guys have been great. I would also mention Miguel Amaya as a guy. Uh, you mentioned the uh, the pitching development, but he's a guy that, you know, you know uh, international signing, and he dealt with a bunch of injuries. You know, went from sort of being a top prospect to forgotten about because he had the uh, the Liz Frank injury, he had the Tommy John injury, but you know he's come back and, and played exceptionally well and uh, had a big been a, been a really big part of this team. So uh, I think he's a guy too that like going into spring training, uh, we were not expecting he'd be on the team most of the year and really contributing at such an important position. But uh, he's done a great job, and I think the future is really bright for him as well. You know, as you can well imagine, we got a ton of people complaining about Wilson Contreras and him leaving, and uh, what were you going to do, Jan Gomes? Is is like a he's like a secret MVP. He's like a guy that has done so much with young pitching. Uh, he's made huge contributions, big hits at unexpected times. That guy has had a phenomenal year all the way around. Yeah, phenomenal season. And you know, if you talk to the guys in the clubhouse and you realize how important he is to what we're doing and from a leadership standpoint, and uh, you know, this is a steadying character in the clubhouse. And then yes, he's had so many. So many big hits, and I thought he had you know two hits in Chicago that really, you know, both led to to wins at the most opportune times. And you know, his at bats and big moments have been calm, and they've been professional, and uh, he's been terrific for us. And like I said, if you talk to his teammates, uh, they can't sing his praises enough. You know, Jed, back in early August, Say Suzuki was struggling. David Ross benched him for four games. Since that point, he's got a three ninety batting average, has hit four home runs, and is a different player. He talked yesterday after the game that you know he had to reset mentally and then he adjusted some things physically and mechanically, and he has been the guy that you expected him to be. He's got a big contract. When something like that happens, does the front office get involved? Is it a collaborative effort when you talk about sitting a proud veteran down for a period of time to allow him to reset, or is that all the manager? Uh, it's definitely collaborative. I mean, you know, Rossi ultimately gets the, the final say on things like that, but um, I think with a player like Saya, it's certainly collective, and even often invo involves the agent and things like that. When you're going to sit a sit a, a veteran player, like you said, on a big contract and kind of take them out of the lineup for a bit, and then you know, hopefully reset them. And this is such a great example. And I, I feel like I, no matter how long I do this, I have to relearn this over and over. Just how bad a player can look, a good player can look when he's going badly. You know, I mean, he was struggling so much. He was caught in between pitches and just taking one ugly swing after another. And, uh, you know, I was watching the game yesterday thinking, like, it's unbelievable what a different person he looks like right now, both in demeanor with his teammates, he's having fun, he's laughing, um, but then also how, how, you know, he's on every pitch right now. He's aggressive on balls in the strike zone. And, you know, I think you look up and down the lineup and almost every player we have at some point has been in that funk, right? I mean, you look at Ian Happ, we, you know, we sent to the minors and he struggled for the, you know, the whole beginning of, of the uh, 21 season. And obviously Nico has had his struggles in part because he was rushed, but he's had his struggles and Danfi did early on. And you just realize that that's our game. You're always, um, you're always fighting through slumps. And when you're in a slump, you look bad. No one slumps and looks pretty. And uh, I think Saya was a good example of that. And uh, all the credit in the world to the hitting coaches and to Saya for working his way through it. And hopefully he can continue this because uh, we feel like a different lineup when he's hitting like this. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a different lineup. I, I'm curious. Uh, we saw Drew Smiley after Marcus Stroman went down. We saw him go back from the bullpen into the rotation, and it was a struggle. And then uh, David Ross said, you know, as you expect a manager to do, said that he wasn't moving him or anything like that. And then it was you that said, oh, no, he's going back to the to the bullpen. <laughs> and I'm just telling you, there were, like, so many calls of relief. It was beyond belief because – People were worried about that. Um, was that – do you do that in in, uh, in combination? Do you let Rossi know that? 
uh, how do you how do you, why did you have to be the one to make that decision? It, it wasn't me directly. I, mean, I, I was the one that announced it probably earlier than I was supposed to. Um, <laughs> you know, but, but uh, you know, I think that was uh, that was a decision that we you know we made after that last start, and uh, you know we had Wicks lined up. We could kind of slot him in anywhere in that. Uh, in that series in Pittsburgh, again, we just decided to do it on Saturday. But that was that was really the issue. We were trying to decide when to to slot Wicks in. I think he'd been scheduled to pitch on Wednesday, and um, because of that, we could just choose the spot. So that that was why it wasn't certainly wasn't my decision alone. And I mean, and Drew took it great. You know, when I talked to David, he just said, you know, he knows he's struggling. He knows he can help more in the bullpen right now. And um, you know, this is uh, the time of year that you have to make those decisions. And you know, listen, Drew was uh, was excellent for us early in the season. You know, I had a great August and, and second half last year, and we just need to get him on track because you don't know how this is going to play out. You know, we may well need more starts out of him. We're probably going to need some big relief innings out of him. And uh, just because we took him out of the rotation doesn't mean he's not going to help us this year. Talk with Jed Hoyer on the score when Jed's on. It gives us a chance to recognize Lurie's Children's Hospital, ranked the number one children's hospital in Illinois by the U.S. News & World Report, located at 225 East Chicago Avenue in downtown Chicago. Jed, you've made some moves this this season that I think, obviously, you go into spring training, you had invested money in veterans like Eric Hosmer, Trey Mancini, Tucker Barnhart. Not easy to do to kind of make baseball decisions that may not be financially you know, beneficial to you. You want to get the most out of your investment, but you have to give up on guys or move on from guys. How difficult is that for you to do or were those moves to make? because of what you basically were acknowledging in that those weren't really good signings. Yeah. I mean, listen, like whenever you uh, have to release a player and eat money, I mean, that's egg on my face without question, you know, and I think you realize when you go into the free agent market, there's an inherent risk in doing that, you know, that, uh, you know, we had to go into the market for, for too many players last winter. I mean, we had to be sort of over aggressive uh, in that market. And some of the guys that we signed, uh, you know, just did not work out. And, you know, when you're on it, when you have a team that's winning and uh, we have other players that can help more, you have to make those, those harsh decisions. And, you know, to me, the, the lesson from all of it is it's why player development is so important that you want to go into free agent market in a, in the, into the market in a really targeted way, target players that you really want. I think when you have to go in and cover a lot of holes, um, then you can end up, you know, getting yourself in trouble. And, you know, listen, I couldn't have been more excited to, to sign Trey, for example. I thought he was going to provide power that we were lacking in the lineup, and it just didn't work out. And um, obviously that's a, you know, that's a frustrating one for us. But when you're in a pennant race, you have to make those hard decisions, and unfortunately we had to make that one. Jed, can you give us any kind of update on Stroman? Is he – I mean, he's recovering from the, the fractured rib cartilage. Is there any – understanding of how long that takes of what the ramp up would be if he were to come back are you expecting him come playoff time please god you get there i'm hopeful yeah I mean, he's going to be in chicago today uh we'll, our doctors will get a chance to see him I, I know he feels better i know he doesn't feel perfect yet um and it's a frustrating injury because it's a rest injury it's not a real time frame you know honestly because it's not something we normally deal with so I know he's feeling better. We're hopeful, and I think we'll have more sense after he sees a doctor today just what the rest of the month can look like. We are four days from September 1st, and all Cub fans want to know about what that means for Pete Crow Armstrong. And we saw him running into the wall, making a great catch over the weekend. And, boy, you can't do that at Wrigley Field, but you like to see the aggressiveness. You know what he is defensively. What is ahead for him Jed, I mean, PCA is a guy we've been talking about for a long time, it seems. And I wonder, does the success of Jordan Wicks in the midst of what he did Saturday night with that kind of pressure affect your thinking at all about putting a young player in that position? Yeah, I mean, certainly the pressure part is not a, a consideration. We certainly would. Uh, he, I think he's ready for it in terms of like the emotional part of it. I mean, we have to decide, you know, we have to like make it decide a lot of things uh, as we get into September and Obviously, he's been outstanding uh, for us in AAA. Uh, we know he has a super bright future. He's going to help us win a lot. Uh, what we're going to decide as far as September, we, we just haven't yet. Um, and and I would even add, like, you know, the way things work now with, you know, the reduced September rosters and people option uh, guys back and forth now during September, you know, the, September 1st isn't some magical day where we have to make that decision. 
uh, it could come at a, at a later point. So uh, we just want him to keep playing, keep developing. And, uh, yes, we will definitely have the, uh, the brick wall conversation with him before uh, he plays a game at Wrigley. Um, so, uh, but, yeah, he's been, he's been, you know, super exciting. And uh, he, um, the, that catch he made, I think we'll see a lot of those. He's not afraid of the wall. He's not afraid of giving up his body. And uh, he's a and pretty incredible center fielder as a, res- as a result of that, that kind of effort and that kind of ability. Jeb, what did Tommy Hanavi actually say to Jordan Wicks? What what was is there a simple sentence you say to a guy that where he gets fifteen in a row out? Yeah, no, that was uh, pretty <laughs> unbelievable. And just trust yourself. I mean, I think um, it's hard in that moment. Uh, I thought they did an awesome job from a strategic standpoint of uh, you know really uh, going with his changeup, going with his bread and butter. I think if you look at the beginning of that outing, you know he threw two fastballs to, to, to Brian Hayes. Uh, first pitch to Reynolds was a fastball. And, uh, you know, he was trying to establish his fastball right away. And, you know, the big uh, the big conversation with Amaya was just, hey, let's let's get to the change up here uh, and let's, re-establish, let's establish that right away, uh, get through this inning. And, I mean, he couldn't have been better. His, his tempo was amazing. He filled the strike zone. Uh, he was so confident after that early one. And uh, no question, that was definitely one of the best mound visits I've seen. But also give Jordan, give Jordan Wicks a lot of credit. I mean, yep. he's out there. You know, he's got – he falls behind the count on the fourth hitter with the other you know, first three guys are on base, and you're you're looking at a, you know, pretty awful debut, and he turned it around and had an incredible one. You know, that isn't easy. Um, I mean, Kyle Hendricks, I remember in Cincinnati struggling in that first inning uh, to get anything going and settling down. I think he gave up four uh, right away. So uh, debuts are hard. You know, the butterflies are there. I'm sure it feels like a surreal out-of-body experience for a lot of guys. And to write the ship after the, the beginning was uh, says a lot about his character. Jed, uh, away from the Cubs for a moment, in your role as team president, on, I wonder if this fell on your desk. On Friday night at Guaranteed Rate Field, at least two people were wounded by gunfire in Section 161 uh, during the game in the third inning. With the three-game series against the Brewers, the first time back at Wrigley Field, I wondered if the league has been involved or contacted teams to remind them whether it's heightened security or awareness of just what happened and how to proceed from here. Uh, it hasn't come across my desk. It would probably come across someone in, in uh, facilities, but those guys do a great job. Um, I know that it'll be totally safe tonight, and I think that's the, the most important thing. And you know, going to a ball game should be something that's completely safe and family friendly, and you, know, you, you want us to enjoy the game. And uh, obviously, it's, it's unfortunate what happened. And uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think we're just still trying to figure out the details. But yeah, scary for sure because there is an innocence that you want to have at a professional stadium where you can just watch a sporting event, watch the best players in the world, and then you know head home safely. And uh, you have to have that to to have the experience be what it should be. I'm just curious about Christopher Morrell. You know, he hits the ball really hard. He's hot and cold. I get that, but man, he and he's he's a very energetic guy. Do you do you have a long term position for him yet? Is there anything that you that you view him doing other than DHing at this point? Yeah, well, I think that's one of the challenges we've had with, with him and for him is that you know, we have the positions covered, and so he's been forced into a, sort of a a super utility role, which is really hard. Like we haven't given him the ability to, to, to just go focus on a corner outfield spot or go focus right. on second base or first base or whatever it might be. So it's sort of on us in a way that we haven't just given him a position. Uh, and that is something we have to discuss in the off season. Do we just kind of give him a spot and let him work on it? Because he's got great arm. He's fast. He's got good hands. We just need him to be able to focus on one thing and, I think really evaluating his defense until he's able to do that, I think is probably unfair. So that is a discussion. You know, versatility is valuable, but sometimes, you know, versatility without any primary position can be really difficult. Jed, I think Jordan Wicks was mic'd up yesterday doing an interview with Mark Key when Cody Bellinger was at the plate and hit a two run double. And you heard Jordan Wicks just say, this guy is so good. And I think <laughs> that's the reaction we have so often with Cody Bellinger who drove in five yesterday and has put himself in the MVP conversation uh, this year again, how I mean, we've taken it for granted almost because we haven't even mentioned him and in talking about your team, and yet he has been the most consistent player on this team. How surprised are you? Uh, I am surprised. You know, when we signed him, obviously our hope was that he would 
you know, get a real bounce back from the, the you know, the 21 and 22 seasons. Um, we didn't necessarily, necessarily expect he was going to, you know, go back to a, a different player, but certainly a, a version of the 2019 Cody Bellinger that won an MVP award. I mean, he's, the power was different then, but the, you know, the contact has been incredible. The batting average, uh, I mean, the RBI ability, the, the, the driving runs, it has been just incredible. What I, I say is 50 RBIs in the last 50 games. And this feels like he's bailed us out of more two, uh, two out situations. It's been amazing how many, how often it seems like we, a rally might seem like it's fizzling or you, you know, you need a big knock and you just, it's just, you almost take it for granted how often he's come up big. So our hope was that he would bounce back and, and come back, go back to being a really good player fueled by his legs and, you know, you know the base running, all those things. But, you know, for him to, to really go out and have a MVP type of season is something that was kind of beyond our, our imagination. And I'm just glad he's doing it because it's been so much fun for everyone to watch. You know, I, I was saying to David, the 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 uh, Otani Shohei Otani injury is bad for baseball. It's just bad to see a guy that can do the extraordinary things he could do, and and you know now you're getting rid of the the pitching element. Is it bad for the Cubs just because now all these teams with money are going to come running after uh, Cody? Is that am I imagining that, or I'm creating a problem? Yeah, I mean, I can't really talk about that part. I will say I think it's definitely bad for baseball. I mean, what he's, you know, what, I feel like he's doing the one sport version of like Bo, Bo Jackson or you know Deion Sanders or whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's so it's so unbelievable what he's able to do, and you just want him to be able to continue to do it because you know no one else in our sport is doing it, let alone the way he's doing it, which is at, at the super elite level of both. So it is bad for the game. I certainly hope he gets healthy and, and gets back to that because. Um, it's a treat. It's a treat for this generation to be able to watch it, and, and hopefully they'll be able to continue to watch it. Have you had your fantasy football draft yet? <laughs> no, I got a bunch next week. Um, I put in put in zero work, so it's not, it might not be pretty. I might be relying on my 11-year-old son for help on that one. <laughs> so. Good luck with that. Great stuff, Thank Jed. You. Good luck tonight. Good luck in these series coming up, and, uh, and really been a fun season. Thank you. Thanks, Jed. Awesome. I appreciate it, guys. Take care. That is Jed Hoyer.